Okay, well, welcome everybody to tonight's Development Studies Seminar. Uh, we're delighted to have with us Professor Henry Veltmeyer, Research Professor in Development Studies at the Autonomous University of Zacatecas, Mexico, and Professor Emeritus of International Development Studies at St. Mary's University, Canada. Anybody who studied Development Studies at SOAS will, of course, be incredibly familiar with his work, or you soon will be, um, as he's a leading theorist in the field of critical and post-development studies, authoring over 40 books and countless articles. His highly influential contributions to the field encompass work on neoliberalism and alternatives to it, imperialism, globalization, popular resistance, including social and peasants' movements, the state and democracy, extractivism and development, social change and class structures in Latin America and beyond. His most recent works, all of them published in the last two years, include development, uh, Critical Development Studies, an introduction, the Essential Guide to Critical Development Studies, Cooperativism and Local Development in Cuba, An Agenda for Democratic Social Change, Class Struggle in Latin America, Making History Today. Um, today he's going to talk to us on the topic of Beyond Neoliberalism or Capitalism, the Latin American Experience. Uh, we're delighted to also have with us joining Joining Henry to discuss this topic, Dr. Leandro Bagara Camus, Senior Lecturer in the Theory and Policy and Practice of Development here at the Development Studies Department at SOAS. Leandro's expertise includes theories of development, the political economy of development, and the historical sociology of state and class formation. His work on the Latin American left and history of land struggles includes the important 2014 book, Land and Freedom, the Peasant Development Alternatives to Neoliberalism of the Landless People of Brazil and the Zapatista Movement in Chiapas. Uh, before we start, if you want to tweet tonight, and I would encourage you to do so, the hashtags are SOAS Dev Studies and ESRC. Uh, our speaker will speak for around 45 minutes, and then Leandro will respond. Uh, 45? <laughs> um, and then we'll take uh, a good chunk of time for your questions uh, and, and have a discussion on these issues. So I'd like to hand over to you. Let's see. If I can get some elevation from a laptop with my aging eyes, can't have it too far away from my... Ah, should work. <laughs> well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm very pleased indeed to be here with you all, to be invited by SOAS to share some ideas based on some recent research conducted in Latin America, but that I believe to be highly relevant for students of development elsewhere, more generally, as well as Oriental and African studies related to development. Especially for those who are concerned, as I am, with the systemic foundations of development. Of development, whether understood as a project consciously designed to improve the social condition of a define or target the population, or understood as a process based on the workings of a system, what some call the world capitalist system. A system that more or less disappears, I'm sure you've noticed, in mainstream studies of development from discourse, from analysis. It's virtually as if capitalism, it's so uh, taken for granted you don't have to talk about it. It's an unmentionable and is not mentioned or discussed in most uh, studies in the mainstream, which is why it's so central for what we call critical development studies, which is uh, a network of activist scholars concerned to give development a more critical edge. And for that, it means uh, shifting the focus from institutional development within the system or policies, strategies, changes within the system to the system itself, to its pillars, its fundamental dynamics that uh, relate to the workings of that system. We argue that system should be the primary unit of analysis for in development studies. Anyway, I propose today 
to explore or at least overview the dynamics of a development process that has unfolded over the, the last three decades of what David Harvey, among others, have labeled the neoliberal era. My proposal is to review these dynamics in the Latin American context because the neoliberal agenda has had its greatest impact in Latin America uh, as opposed to other macro regions of the world system. Uh, which, and as a result, the forces of resistance to uh, the develop, capital development have been more powerful uh, in Latin America than anywhere else. And that's because the uh, neoliberal policy agenda has been, uh, as I said, implemented with such force and devastating negative impact. It's also possible in the Latin American context to review the experience, uh, development experience the last couple of uh, decades, to trace out the contours of what an alternative development pathway a world beyond neoliberalism, or even, hopefully even capitalism, might look like. Latin America, in fact, is sort of like a, it's a laboratory, a virtual laboratory for the study of the contemporary dynamics of both the forces of capital development and the forces of resistance to that development. Um, at the moment, one could argue that Latin America is sort of caught up in the vortex of these conflicting forces, forces of development, forces of change that push towards change, and forces of resistance. Forces that can be mobilized to the right or to the left, depending on the correlation of force in the class struggle. You know, so uh, you cannot determine theoretically the outcome of uh, this development. It depends on understanding the correlation of uh, force and the specific conditions found in different situations. Uh, but it is possible to analyze the, this process backwards, if you like, in hindsight, or looking over the last couple of years. This is uh, what we have attempted to do. Uh, to elaborate on this point, every advance of capital in the development process, and I said that's what development is basically about, can be analyzed then at two levels. First, at the level of development, which is to say the development of the forces of production, or the capital development of the force of production, capital development in short. And secondly, at the level of the social relations that correspond to that uh, development, uh, as well as the forces of resistance generated by each advance of capital in the development process. Uh, so the argument basically is that as capital advances in the development process, it generates forces of resistance. So it's possible to trace out the history of development through a series of cycles, cycles of development and cycles of resistance to, to that development. And what I'll try to do is uh, just briefly summarize some of the salient features of the last three cycles of development resistance, uh, which have unfolded in over the last uh, so called uh, six developmental decades since the second post war, second world war, when the development project was invented. Uh, invented, as we'll see, in order to uh, prevent countries that were trying to liberate themselves from the yoke of colonial uh, rule and British imperialism from pursuing a socialist path towards development and to lead them to pursue a capitalist path. Development as a project was designed to prevent that, to ensure that these countries liberate, who are in the process of liberating themselves from colonialism would pursue a national uh, a, a capitalist path towards nation building and economic development. Um, as I said, I propose to focus on the working of these forces, development and resistance, 
in the context of what we understand as the neoliberal era, which can be dated from the construction in the early 80s, 1980s, of a new world order. Uh, that was designed, and here I will quote from the National Security Point uh, Report 2012 of George W. Bush, who talked about um, the need to liberate the forces of economic freedom and democracy from the regulatory constraints of the development, developmental and welfare state. So th that was the, uh, the aim, is to basically uh, take the government out of the development process, the state out of the development process, uh, relying based on, on this belief in the virtues of free market capitalism, uh, that it can, you know, uh, basically liberate all these forces of uh, development and create conditions of economic growth and uh, prosperity for all. It's interesting that this was uh, presented in a national security report, since uh, one could argue it's from the very beginning, development uh, was basically seen by the U.S. state public officials as a security issue. Now, the reason for my focus on Latin America, apart from the fact that it's my major uh, area of interest and research, is, as I said, in no other macro region of the world system has the neoliberal policy agenda been impl implemented with such a devastating force, and no other region has the force of resistance been so, let's say, uh, resilient and powerful. Popular resistance. Popular resistance in the form of not only collective actions of protest, but in particular in the form of social movements. Social movements that in the neoliberal era were targeted against the implementation of the neoliberal policy agenda. Uh, the neoliberal era then, uh, which basically includes uh, three decades, one under the so-called Washington Consensus, you know, on the, on, on the need to take the state out of the development process, and then two decades under the post-Washington Consensus, formed in the early 90s, uh, of the need to bring the state back in and to generate a more inclusive form of development. And by inclusive development, they basically mean reduction of poverty. Uh, this uh, followed three decades of development under the, with the, under the agency of the uh, state, the so-called old developmentalism for 50s to the 70s. Whereas, the new, whereas in the, the 90s, in this neoliberal world order, you, you have this project, what uh, Latin American uh, theorists at the Economic Commission for Latin America, UN Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, what they call neo-developmentalism, <coughs> as I said, which is, which is basically uh, neoliberalism in terms of macroeconomic policy but adding to it a new social policy targeting poverty, as well as a policy of uh, administrative decentralization that brings government closer to the people and that allows for popular participation uh, or uh, social participation in the development process. And by social participation, they basically are referring to uh, the uh, uh, engagement of civil society, non-governmental organizations in the development process as a strategic partner. In Bolivia, they would call this popu uh, popular participation. And there was even in the mid-90s a neoliberal law called the uh, law of popular participation. And that's because in Bolivia, uh, you have not much of a civil society, but you have a very large society of indigenous communities. And that's the, why the reference to popular rather than uh, social uh, uh, participation. As I said, uh, I've made reference to three development cycles in the post-war period, but I will concentrate on the third, 
in the neoliberal era. But let me just say a couple of things about the, uh, the first cycle. Uh, I am forgetting <laughs> to see, let me just see where we are. <laughs> We've covered this. We've covered that. Covered that. Oh, no, we haven't. <laughs> Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll see if I can catch up to there. Um, sorry about losing that there. Yeah. This uh, third cycle, uh, I'll, I'll go straight to the third uh, cycle of development and resistance, is related to the advance of capital in a specific form called, uh, of, of course, direct foreign direct investment in the uh, acquisition of land and extraction of natural resources, uh, minerals, metals, uh, fossil fuels, uh, and the like, uh, and for the purpose of exporting these resources on the world market to take advantage of a, uh, a primary commodities boom, a great demand for these resources uh, by China and other emerging markets, India, etc., but particularly uh, China, both in terms of its industries and its middle class were demanding these resources uh, to which then uh, uh, the multinational corporations in the extractive sector responded by investing heavily in these natural resources and throughout the 90s you can see a sh sectoral shift from investment in manufacturing industry and services towards uh, natural resources. So you have sort of resource seeking extractive capital we, we might say. So the development process in Latin America anyway was sort of bound up with this uh, emergence of a new form of capitalism, extractive capitalism. And I say a new form of capitalism because it is. Capitalism takes various forms. The normal form, the form of capitalism, capitalism as you know it probably, is based on uh, in, uh, the construction of industry based on the exploitation of surplus labor generated by the capital development of, of industry. As, as, as Arthur Lewis once said, you know, it's to take advantage of the unlimited supply of surplus labor presented by agriculture. Uh, for urban-based uh, industry. Uh, so that capital development is very much based on a core role of labor, which not only added value to the, the product, but is basically the source of the value of the product on the world market. Okay? But under extractive capitalism, you have the exploitation not just of labor, but of nature which is to say the value of the product on the global market can't be calculated just in terms of the amount of labor expended in the production of that commodity. That uh, the sort of a natural value, uh, the wealth of nature, uh, which then is appropriated not as surplus uh, value by capital for profit, but as rent, resource rent, subsoil, resource rent, ground rent, etc. And it's very important because um, the dynamics, economic political dynamics of extractive capitalism are different from the, the dynamics of industrial capitalism. For one thing, as I said, labor is a much, plays a much smaller role, maybe uh, constituting maybe 10% or less of value of the product, and uh, which is then returned to it uh, in the form of a wage, which then represents about 10% of the product. The state captures another 10% of the product in the form of uh, rents, royalties, and taxes, etc. That means that at least 80% of the value of the product in the world market is uh, appropriated by uh, groups outside the country. In other words, 
there's very little developmental uh, sort of multiplier effect to the employment and uh, income or development s spread that industrial capitalism brings. Uh, and industrial capitalism, labor can uh, participate up to 60% of the value of the product. So that makes a huge difference, both economically and, and politically. So we are talking of the emergence of uh, essentially a new form of capitalism. This is not to say of, uh, that it's just a shift from one form of, to another, because, because different forms of capitalism always uh, coexist in combination, in different forms. But uh, what, what it happens is that extractive capital begins to play a more predominant role. In Latin America, you also have elements of what could be called, what we call in our most recent book, macro capitalism, which is basically based on the accumulation of cap, uh, capital, capital accumulated in the drug trades, which creates enormous fortunes, which like any kind of form of money, if it's invested productively in the employment of labor, etc., it's converted into capital, and then you have a different form of capitalism, right? So the point is, one uh, should distinguish between uh, different forms of capitalism uh, in order to be able to identify the major, uh, the differences in uh, <laughs> dynamics. And there's also a difference in the forms of resistance to this development. So, for example, in the um, 50s and 60s, uh, The major re the resistance took the form of a labor movement and a land struggle, you know, uh, against the uh, advance of uh, capital. But these forces of resistance were destroyed by the end of the 70s by a combination of two strategies: uh, development, which is that which was basically um, a project offered the program offered the poor as an alternative to joining revolutionary social movement, movements that demand revolutionary change and national liberation. So in order to avoid the, uh, uh, let's say, the political conflicts and the, the politics um, of, of the, uh, the social movements, the revolutionary politics, they designed an alternative, uh, an alternative what was then called development, in terms of uh, community, delivered community-based development projects and a uh, state program of land reform and technical financial assistance, foreign aid, they called it. So, so this is how, in fact, development originated as a project of international cooperation with the efforts of nation building of countries trying to uh, escape uh, colonialism, but then in the 60s, with the advent of Cuba, uh, which basically, you know, uh, which is a successful, uh, let's say, advent of a revolutionary movement, one of the armies of national liberation that were found all over the world at that time, uh, came to state power. And the uh, guardians of the system were concerned to prevent another Cuba. So in order to prevent another Cuba, they uh, turned towards development. At that time, it was called integrated rural development, uh, as I say, as, a, as, an, as an alternative to joining the, uh, uh, the, the, the social movements. When the peasants, the who were dispossessed, many of them from the land, through a process of uh, capital development of agriculture, you have these dispossessed peasants um, who were um, in development discourse, it's called the rural poor. They were impoverished by the system and then helped by them, uh, and then encouraged by the World Bank and other development agencies to take the development pathway out of rural poverty namely migration and labor, okay? Um, that was the 
development process in the first cycle, and the uh, land struggle and the labor movement represented the, uh, let's say, the, the cycle of resistance at that level. But by the end of the 70s, the resistance, the resistance, the force of resistance were destroyed, weakened, decimated, dispersed, uh, because uh, through a combination of two strategies. Development strategy, no, rural development, uh, and state repression. And that, was, uh, and that was when the peasants didn't take the bait. They didn't take what was offered to them. Development, they didn't take the development uh, option. Then they were off, the option was given to them was uh, uh, to confront the state in armed force. And most of these national liberation movements, all except in Colombia, the FARC, were destroyed in, in, in the 60s and 70s through a combination of state repression and development. Development representing sort of like the, how do we say, the soft side of what some call U.S. imperialism. In other words, the velvet glove, which is then offered to the peasants, to the rural poor, and uh, when they reject it, velvet glove, then the iron fist comes out. The state comes in. That was developed in the first cycle. Um, the resistance, as I said, then and later has generally taken the form of collective, pro collective actions in protest and social movements, different forms. So you have different cycles of social movements uh, that provide, and as well as the construction of alternative models of development. So when you look at the resistance in Latin America today, it's not only the question of analyzing the dynamics of uh, so social movements, uh, resisting the implementation of the advance of capital or the implementation of neoliberal policy uh, agenda, but it's actually in the act of construction and search for alternatives to capitalist development. So uh, a major feature of the resistance in the Latin American contemporary context is the search for a way out not only of the crisis or of capitalism, but uh, a search for an alternative. Alternatives to uh, neoliberalism, sort of with the construction of various post-neoliberal models, what we call post-development, and even uh, alternatives to uh, capitalism. Uh, in the, in, the, in the discourse of critical development studies, which um, I'm a, a part of, this is called post-development, where development is sort of understood or equated with capitalism. Okay? As I said, it's not mentioned. When you, when you discuss development in the mainstream, capitalism disappears. But when you talk of development, you're talking of capitalist development not social development, or et cetera. So in other words, it's development that uh, is based on a, a program constructed within a framework of a particular system with certain dynamics. So I'll use the word development. <laughs> well, what I'm talking about is capitalist development, OK? Uh, just a brief footnote. By reference to this uh, critical development studies, I referred to I might have mentioned already, a network of scholars you know, concerned to give uh, development a, um, a, a, a critical edge. I might just take the opportunity here to provide a brief commercial about uh, a recent book. You may have even seen it. Some of you might even have used it. What is it called? The Essential Guide to Critical Development Studies, which represents a, a collaborative venture and collective effort of some 38 scholars around the world, inclu including several here at SOAS, uh, like Elisa van der Wegen, who's one of the three editors, 
of the Critical Development Studies book program uh, at Routledge. So uh, Routledge publishes for this network a series of books on the theme, Critical Development Studies. So if anyone has a project, book project, talk to me, email me, and we'll see uh, what we can do with it. And of course we have Leandro, who is part of this network, and uh, he's part of their book. So, having trouble following my uh, PowerPoint here, so cycle one, we just finished discussing that, eh? Oh, just one, yes, I would just like to pinpo uh, the, uh, pinpoint the importance of this book. Uh, no, forget that book. <laughs> <laughs> this you have seen. This book I would strongly uh, recommend. For, for, for people who want to trace out the resistance cycle in the first period, the first cycle, the, the era of the development state, this book is uh, excellent, very, very good. It is the major resource of uh, resistance, not just Latin America, but all over the world, in Asia and Africa uh, as well. And a number of SOAS sc scholars co uh, contributed to, to this book. I mentioned that, the end of the resistance in the first cycle. Second cycle, let me just see if I can catch up to you. As I mentioned, the 1980s saw an epoch-changing, uh, epoch-defining change in the system of global governance. That is, the rules used to govern international, economic, and political relations, a new world order, as I said, that provided not only a new set of rules for global governance, but the institutional framework of a neoliberal program of structural reforms in macroeconomic policy based on what I mentioned earlier, uh, known as the Washington Consensus. We also, at the time, we also had or saw the emergence of a new economic model, model used to guide uh, public policy. Uh, this model of structural reform, which basically in included uh, globalization, privatization, deregulation of markets, liberalization of uh, the circuits of capital and uh, trade, etc., and administrative decentralization, which was uh, a reform, a neoliberal reform, which is often not mentioned, but very, very important. Uh, this was a reform invented by Augusto Pinochet, dictator, military dictator in Chile in the 70s, who argued that he was going to teach the world uh, about democracy, how to bring about democracy. And he was going to bring, a, bring about democracy, promote democracy through this policy of administrative decentralization. So, as I say, it, it, is, it is important. It is a, even though the, the left can't oppose it, uh, it's not a left policy. It, it, was, it originated as a, as, a, as a neoliberal policy. Anyway, the aim of the structural reform agenda was to promote economic growth, but what you have instead of promoting economic growth, you you have the uh, uh, the uh, destruction of forces of production in agriculture and industry, which resulted in um, how do you say the the uh, disappearance of an industrial proletariat. Uh, government policy in Brazil and uh, Argentina had the industrial policy of these governments were generating an industrial working class. But in the 80s, uh, the, uh, this industrial policy was against the rules, and there was the elimination of this policy and the uh, invasion of foreign direct investment. 
in take over in a lot of these uh, privatized firms, etc., you have the virtual destruction of forces of production built up over decades, both in agriculture and industry, resulting in, uh, um, ironically, uh, orthodox Marxist theory had it that the end result would be the disappearance of the peasantry. But the argument is that as capital advances in development process, it would bring about a process of productive and social transformation of a uh, traditional agrarian society based on pre-capital relations into a modern industrial system, and then the transformation of the peasantry into a uh, working class. A proletariat, which refers to a class of people who own nothing but the capacity to labor, which therefore they have to exchange against capital for a living wage. So the proletariat becomes the source of the working class. So basically, a couple development is the history of the transformation of the peasants into work, industrial working class or proletariat. That's, the, that's, that's actually Marxist theory, but it's also orthodox economic development theory, uh, which we haven't got, got time to, to go into. Uh, so there's been a lot of debates in Latin America and elsewhere about this, about this what's called the agrarian question. The disappearance of the peasantry, which uh, will be brought about inevitably by the forces of capitalist uh, uh, development. So some argue, you know, you have the uh, proletarianists who argue that this is inevitable, the peasants are fated to disappear in the dustbin of history, etc., uh, you know, and you have the proletarianization of these peasants, and then you have others, the peasantists, who argue, no, uh, Agriculture provides obstacles to the uh, advance of capital and peasants, peasants and rural poverty based on peasant economy will persist and still persist. And you have very recent ongoing uh, debates on this question. So the, the, the primary focus is always on the uh, disappearance of the peasantry. But what you have, ironically, in the 80s in Latin America was the disappearance of the uh, industrial proletariat, uh, which you can see in, for example, the fact that over 80%, up to 90% of all new jobs formed in the, throughout the whole decade were formed in what's called the informal sector of the urban economy where um, um, rural migrants fend for themselves uh, and, well, work on their own account in the streets rather than for wages in, in factories, offices, uh, etc. So you have a tremendous growth of the so-called informal sector and associated with it with what the sociologist Davis, Mike Davis called uh, uh, a planet of uh, slums. So what you have, rather than, ha rather than um, um, having... Uh, uh, the formation of industrial proletariat based on industrial capitalism, which was expected, which was the, the theory of both modernization theorists and Marxists, what you have is the formation of what we call a semi-proletariat, which is a group of people, a class of people, with one foot in the countryside and one foot in the urban centers on the margins of the, the modern uh, capitalist uh, system. So take the case, for example, a city like in Bolivia, uh, El Alto, which is the biggest city in the country, above the capital, very high, hard to breathe, people like me. A uh, million people, 80% uh, of the people who work there on the streets during the week go back home to the rural communities on the weekends. So in other words, they have not totally abandoned or become disconnected from the rural communities or agriculture. They're still able to uh, mix agriculture, some agriculture in with some labor, you know, in order to make ends meet. So they're able to diversify uh, the different, their household incomes to include some labor income, some agricultural uh, uh, income, some um, remittances, which is from 
the uh, migrants abroad who are sent back to the families back home, uh, part of their wages, etc. And these remittances are huge. In countries like Mexico and Bolivia, Ecuador, there's the second highest source of foreign um, exchange used to balance the trade account in the country. It's based on, uh, on this income <coughs> remitted by these uh, migrants. And of course, you also have now uh, development projects. It's part of the mix uh, with international cooperation. And you have a new policy created, uh, designed, invented by the ex-president of Brazil, Lula, leader of the Workers' Party, which was to transfer directly to the poor income, conditional cash transfer. Conditional because the income was transferred directly to poor families, to the female head of the household. For all these reasons, you can't transfer to the male head of the household. So, because you had to ensure that the children would go to the school or to the clinic. That was the condition for uh, getting that transfer of income. Well, if you define po poverty like the World Bank does as a uh, dollar twenty-five, whatever, same poverty a day, uh, you're looking about thirty some dollars a month. Uh, if you then get a bonus from the government of thirty dollars a month, transferred directly to the household, you eliminate overnight poverty. Same poverty, eliminated, and that's what happened supposedly in uh, in uh, well in Bolivia, in Brazil, Argentina, etc. In the first decade of this uh, new century, uh, what you have in that period, you have come to power. Uh, the political left in a formation in what's called a pink or red wave of regime change in which uh, the governments were then taken over by the center-left parties who then pursued a post-neoliberal program of inclusive development oriented towards the reduction of poverty which was then financed, this is called the new developmentalism, neo-developmentalism, financed by the proceeds of the exports of these raw materials. Now, the, the, the minerals, the metals, the uh, agri-food products, etc., oil and gas, etc. So these natural resource wealth was exported in primary commodity form, not processed, not industrialized, just exported. Uh, it was based on direct foreign investment, capital, multinational companies in this extractive sector who then came to the country, was given the license by the government uh, to extract these resources under 30-year contracts, etc., and to export them on the world market for, as I said, with the, most of the, uh, the wealth going, leaving the country and um, all the problems, social environmental problems, left to, uh, to the communities close by the extractive sites because extractive capitalism is, takes an enclave form in the countryside, mines, etc., in territories uh, inhabited by indigenous communities and people, etc., who are obviously impacted directly. And as I said, uh, some are convinced to support, provide a social license, uh, uh, to support these uh, extractive activities with uh, the offer of some jobs, some other crumbs like uh, development projects where these companies, uh, you know, uh, offer uh, $60,000 to this municipality, uh, you know, to build a bridge or a school, etc., you know, on condition, of course, that they uh, uh, consent to the operation of this mind. So anyway, there's a lot of issues here which we can't get into. Five minutes? Okay. Um, suffice it to say that uh, this development generated tremendous, has generated tremendous sources of resistance on the extractive frontier. New forms of resistance. Not like in the 60s and 70s where the resistance took form of social movements for to demand um, improvement in labor, wages, 
and uh, access land, nor in the second cycle, which is in the 1990s, where resistance took the form of social movements uh, mobilized, where the resistance mobilized against the government neoliberal policy agenda. This, these movements, peasant movements in the 90s, uh, it's been studied by a friend here uh, in Nardo, uh, were so successful in halting, slowing down, stopping the neoliberal agenda that by the end of the decade, the neoliberal agenda, policy agenda in Latin America was more or less dead. So creating the conditions which allowed for the emergence of the center-left in political power, forming these post-neoliberal regimes. Of course, once these, the center-left came to power, they turned their backs on the social movements and did their thing. Of course, um, this primary commodity cycle uh, which began in 2002-03, finished more or less in 2000, came to an end, 2012-13, the 10-year cycle. And with the end of that primary commodity cycle was the end of the progressive cycle in Latin American politics, resulting in another pendular swing from the left to the right, which we are in the middle of right now. In the last five years, there's been a dramatic... Mexico is an exception for an uh, interesting case. But uh, generally, you have this shift back from the left um, to the right. So, so the, which, uh, but, but within that policy, electoral policy, the swing to the right, you still have on, on the popular level, in the countryside, you still have these uh, very active forces of resistance. Uh, resistance uh, which don't seem to be taken which take the form of movements, uh, social environmental movements of uh, protest opposition to the negative social environmental impacts of, uh, of ext extractivism, extractive operations. And also uh, uh, resistance against the forces of development, capital development, that are once again pushing them off the land, out of the communities, uh, Basically, basically because uh, of contamination of the air, of the water, of uh, damage to their health, and uh, other problems uh, associated with, uh, you know, basically operating mines and uh, extractive activities in their territories. So, uh, which then also has led to what's called a new form of enclosures. In other words. Uh, preventing access to the commons, the global commons of land, water, territory, subsoil resources, etc. And as you know, that's where capitalism began in the 19th century in England with the enclosure movement, with the uh, preventing access to the global commons. Well, you have now a repeat of that process, what some uh, David Harvey is called uh, um, accumulation by uh, by dispossession. So we have new forms of resistance, uh, and the big argument, the big question is, can this resistance connect with the resistance that's occurring in the urban centres, like the resistance against the uh, neoliberal policies in Argentina and Brazil? What's happening right now in the urban centres? It's always been a problem how to bring the rural struggles and the urban struggles t together. Some people look at these forces of uh, resistance in the countryside, like David Barkin looks at them as a, as a new uh, revolutionary subject. In other words, with the capacity, the potential of bringing about uh, transformative social change. I myself, much more skeptical than that. I wouldn't, they don't seem to be a, a revolutionary force. Uh, Leandro may uh, disagree uh, on this. I don't know. But for sure, once again, the struggle, even though it's no longer a class struggle, now it's a territorial struggle. You have a transformation of what used to be a class struggle into a territorial uh, struggle uh, is being led by uh, the rural poor. Anyway, uh, I better end there since I'm out of time. Yeah? <laughs> Leandro, over to you.
much have you preferred? No. I guess we just pick <coughs> the table. Hello? I'll move to the table. Okay. <coughs> All right. Hello, hello, hello. Yes, well, um, thank you very much uh, to the organizer for uh, inviting me to participate, Faisy, Joe. Um, it's a pleasure and an honor to be uh, uh, discussing uh, in Ari Veltmeyer's talk. When um, I was doing my PhD only a few years ago, no, not really. Uh, when I was doing my PhD on peasant movement in Latin America, his work was very, very important because he was arguing in the, in the, in the early 2000s or late 90s that the new, uh, the, the new peasantry or the new peasant movement in Latin America were completely different than the previous one and was arguing that uh, this idea that the peasantry was going to disappear was actually not true and that the peasantry was at the forefront of uh, many struggles and it has proven true uh, that they've been at the forefront of, of many struggle. I also agree, I, I, he has 40 books, more than 40 books published, he's always following the trends, he's always intervening in the debates. Recently, he has one of the, a very good book on alternative uh, to uh, neoliberalism in Latin America, where he covers, he analyzes critically the different theorization on uh, alternative development, post-development. That was also extremely useful for my own work. And recently, he has worked a lot on a new extractivism, and especially the contradictions of left-wing governments in Latin America relying on extractivism for uh, their model of development. Um, I agree with several of the things that he mentioned today, especially uh, this process of disappearance of the working class in Latin America and the, on, during the era of neoliberalism and the centrality, of course, of peasant community, indigenous people in the struggle against uh, neoliberalism. I also think that, as he argues, uh, Latin America is kind of a step ahead in this process of neoliberal restructuring. I very often, in my, with my colleague that work on South Asia, Subir, for example, all for, uh, we, we, in our discussion on neoliberalism today, we sort of came to the conclusion that what India is going through, Latin America went through in the 90s. And I'll, I'll explain a little a bit why I think that, and maybe to open the discussion to uh, people that uh, work on other regions of the global south. But uh, Latin America is a kind of uh, experiment for, Latin, for, for, for neoliberalism. If you all remember your history, uh, Allende was trying to establish a socialist regime through democratic means, through radical reforms, land reform, nationalization of, of, uh, of copper, uh, many type of, of radical policy that were leading to a kind of democratic path where socialism and you have a military coup in 1973. Uh, supported by the U.S. but actually led by the dominant uh, classes and the landed classes in Chile and establishes a neoliberal regime very early on in the late 1970s already. Um, so I, will, I, I, I think we have to look at Latin America in, with, with that in mind, that it is a, a, an experiment of, of neoliberalism that can teach us uh, a lot on the different moments of neoliberalism, but also, the, the, as, as Henry is saying, of the different forms that resistance to neoliberalism has taken. Uh, and i more or less going to agree and add to his periodization of neoliberalism. And I would say, I'm going to use actually his own work against him. Uh, <laughs> Very often I say when I teach about Marx that there's two Marx. There's the structuralist Marx and there's the agency-focused class struggle Marx. Unfortunately, today we got our structuralist Henry instead of our social movement Henry because he has worked a lot on social movements and today he gave us a very broad overview of the different phases of capitalist development with a very capital-centric capital kind of point of view, looking at the models of development. And in only towards the end of the talk, he started talking about the different forms of resistance, uh, and especially the, the, the territorial battles that are going on in Latin America around uh, this expansion of extractive industries uh, in indigenous territories. Uh, 
which is really a, 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 the, the form of struggle is a defense of the commons. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that it's, it's, it's no longer about uh, struggles about land. I think we have an overlap here. It is a struggle for territory, but it's also a struggle for land. Many of these communities are peasant community. They rely on land for their livelihoods. And land is at the central of those territorial battles. But, there, but it, it also goes beyond a land. Water, the control of water is very often one of the trigger of uh, these forms of resistance. So um, I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say what, is, what, is, what I think is missing in the analysis that Henry uh, presented to us is a kind of analysis of the evolution or the learning process of social movement in the resistance to capital or capitalist development in these different periods of these diff different cycles of capitalist expansion that he mentioned. So he mentioned three different cycles. The ISI cycle, which is basically uh, very similar to other regions of the Global South where um, uh, the struggles are for access to land, for access to jobs, uh, the unions, political parties, socialist, communist parties are at the center of these struggles. Uh, in Latin America, there are basically many of them influenced by socialist thinking, many of them led by communist party, socialist party. Many of them, uh, Cuba, for example, taking uh, uh, the, the radical path of armed struggles for uh, establishing socialism. Then you can also think of Nicaragua within that kind of also socialist um, era. That is the for, sort of, and, and basically the form of resistance is through the political party, the mass party that is the emblematic form of organization of the radical left since uh, the Bolshevik revolution more or less. A mass party that is led by a small group of radical intellectuals, uh, uh, but also able to mobilize and uh, activate popular mo mobilization. That's the sort of the form of the of the ISI, let's say until the 1980s, and then we have neoliberalism. And I would say that within neoliberalism, we actually have two different cycles. It's not. I wouldn't say it's one cycle. And the first cycle in Latin America is a, is a cycle uh, that is very violent. If you think about the region, the first experiment of neoliberalism comes in the period of authoritarian regimes, military regimes that are actually uh, trying to annihilate, annihilate the, 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 the social basis of mobilization. So violates, uh, human rights violation, repression, disappearances, uh, unions, political party are made illegal, and basically the form of struggle in that first first era of of neo of uh, neoliberal uh, um, restructuring is a sort of a, a battle for liberal democracy. Actually, a battle for. Uh, just simply establishing liberal democracy again. Uh, some of, some of, of the movements with it, an idea of establishing a different kind of democracy, a radical democracy, more participatory, uh, not only focused on electoral, electoral process, but basically the battle is for bringing back liberal democracy in elections. At the grassroots level, it is about reorganizing communities, reorganizing uh, neighborhoods, a lot of these processes are about self-help organization, common soup kitchens, um, these kinds of movements. They're basically everyday form of resistance, self-help, and they move away from the state. They're less interested in, in the state. They're trying to sort of just recreate something common in uh, working class neighborhoods. And then on top of that, you had the electoral sort of game of political parties. Then the second moment within neoliberalism, I would say, is uh, the moment of failure, the first failure of neoliberalism. Think of Latin America at the end, uh, uh, at the early 90s, and think about who's, who's arriving, who's, who's, who's taking power. And it's, it, it's a moment where rad the radical reforms of neoliberals did not work, did not bring back uh, growth, did not create jobs. And people 
already don't believe the, the, the discourse that neoliberalism is putting forward, and you have a crisis of legitimacy, and people start saying, well, the politicians are, are, are the problem. Politicians are all the same, they're corrupt, blah, blah, blah. Looks very similar to what is going on today, globally. But Latin America lived that in the 90s. And then who came to power? Menem, populist right wing. Uh, Fujimori, populist right wing. Um, Color de Melo, populist right wing. All of them coming to power in the early 90s in Latin America, coming with this sort of a mantra of being businessman, not being politician. So that we are going to solve the problem. We're not politicians. We are. We don't. We know how to uh, make profits. We're going to org reorganize the state into a competitive entity and all that. And that is the moment of of, of crisis of neoliberalism. But it's one path. It's the right wing path. But then, towards the end of the 90s, comes the the new left and comes. And that path is is opened by Chavez in Venezuela. Also a kind of socialist populist uh, leader, but with a, an objective of creating a social movement around him, creating a different form of democracy and mobilizing civil society. And then you have uh, in the mid 2000s, again, uh, again on the wave of this crisis of legitimacy of neoliberalism, left-wing governments that come in, Evo Morales in Bolivia, Correa in Ecuador, uh, 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 Lula in Brazil, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, we, we, who present themselves as, again, so we're going to solve the problem of neoliberalism by creating a more inclusive kind of, of, of capitalism. And in that sense, I think we have to make the distinction between anti-neoliberalism struggles in Latin America and anti-capitalist struggle. The most recent wave of resistance to neoliberalism was not anti-capitalist. I think that, that was only a few movements that were anti-capitalist, the Zapatist movement in the late 90s, and the MST to a certain degree. But most of them were basically anti-neoliberal, I would say. And that is, was one of the limits, I, I think, of, of the, 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 the pink tide. And I'd like to hear you a bit more on your critique of the pink tide. And you, you sort of mentioned it towards the end, that the, the, the problem with the pink tide is that it basically wrote, was riding the wave of commodity booms, and that was simply did not change the model of development, just continue extraction, but use part of it for redistribution and reduce extreme poverty. So, um, in terms of the, 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 this, this, this period of crisis of legitimacy of, the, of neoliberalism, you also have a different form of resistance coming from the grassroots movements. And it's, it's, it's when the movement becomes much more uh, uh, powerful and start talking about autonomy, start, uh, start taking control of the means of production, land, factories. Uh, they start organizing a, a, in a relationship of equal to all equal with political parties. They no longer submit themselves to political party as in the earlier waves of mobilization. But then comes in the left-wing governments and w everything that was happening in terms of mobilization, participation, uh, self-governance at the level of grassroots social movements sort of disappears with left-wing governments. And then we have the end of this cycle. It's based, th that cycle, the pink tide, is basically over. And now we have the rise, as was discussed uh, two weeks ago by colleagues on talking about Brazil, of the tide turning. We're now in Latin America are, are in, a, in, a, in a period of right-wing uh, re-emergence, uh, and the movements do no longer have the capacity to fight this right-wing wave, I would say. So I would like to hear uh, Henry's point of view on, 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 on especially the left-wing governments, the limitation of the left-wing governments, and the way these governments sort of were not able to use the, if you want to term, use a, a, a mainstream term, a social capital that social movement had built, this capa political capacity that movement had built uh, in order to radicalize what they were trying to do uh, in, uh, in, in the year that they were in power. Fantastic. So, Henry, would you like a few minutes to respond, uh, perhaps uh, with sure. your class struggle hat on? No, no, uh, uh, I agree with almost everything you said. 
<laughs> in fact, as uh, I told you, I use as use you against you. Yeah, but, uh, so I, in fact, I, I invite you to produce a new book for our series <laughs> that elaborates on this critique. Uh, no, I'm serious. Okay, just a couple of <coughs> smaller points. I probably do, okay, that's it. I probably don't need it anyway. Uh, 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 just a, a footnote on the concept of territory. I think it's very important to distinguish between land and territory. Land was the major struggle in the 20th century, and the 21st century, the major struggle is going to be for water and other elements of uh, territory. Indigenous communities in particular, they're concerned not just with land, as such, as a, as a resource for uh, agriculture, but territory. They have a different conception uh, of nature, of the world, and uh, territory is at the base of that. And uh, territory for them is an it's a area of resistance. It's an area for them of subsistence, uh, search, you know, like for, for the global commons. So it's much more than <coughs> land. So I, I would just... Uh, point out the importance of uh, distinguishing in the struggle for land and territory the, the difference. Because now the, the major struggle, yeah, the land struggle continues, certainly, the MST is still uh, there, but it's a much broader struggle now uh, for territory uh, rather than land. And, and, and I think that is in the context of extractive, <coughs> the operations of extractive capital, okay? Uh, the second point you were asked, you're making some mention about, of course, uh, theory, the whole question of structure versus agency in analysis, right, in social movements, etc. It is true I provided a structural analysis of uh, the development question, uh, but I would argue that uh, structural analysis is the first step then it has to be followed by a political uh, analysis. And this is why my emphasis on not just on the forces of capital development and what it creates and, and the conditions that it creates, but the resistance to that capital development. And when you're talking of resistance, you're talking not just of structure, but you're talking of agency. You're talking of uh, sort of class conscious actions taken on certain ideas. Of course, in sociology, we have these debates on the relative weight or role of structure versus agency, where, with some uh, focused on looking at development as basically the action on ideas or beliefs based on the assumption that there are virtually no structural limitations on that action, mm -hmm. that people are free to think and to act as they would wish, etc. cetera. Uh, so, for example, uh, the reason why women are often found at the bottom of the hierarchy of work is because uh, they're free to choose and they uh, uh, choose shitty jobs, right? So, Neoliberals basically believe in the freedom of the individual to act and to think, and they look at development as the result of actions taken. Uh, you know, the, the choice of people have choices, they have opportunities, and they act on them. That's certainly the, the neoliberal approach to, to uh, development, which is to downplay the working of structural factors, systemic factors, uh, based on so kind of an idealism, idealism of the subject, the, uh, the idealism that people... Uh, can be whatever they want, can do whatever they want, uh, whatever. So that's, a, 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 that's at one end of the spectrum, a, a sort of uh, an idealist belief in the power of ide ideas to determine reality, to bring about its own development, etc. Then on the other side, you have a, a structural analysis, which can also be taken to the extreme, to the extreme of believing that the structure is so omnipotent, so powerful, that there's no room for act, uh, and this is like under Gwyneth Frank, right? I mean, he basically, he was an extreme structuralist, structural determinist, who basically believed that the system is so powerful uh, that you can go to the deepest uh, parts of the Amazon, the system will get you. You know, it's that there's no capacity to act or to resist because the forces, uh, systemic forces are just too powerful. 
Now, th that is an absurd position. Like, and of course, Marxists also have their equivalence to that, sort of a, we, what we will call structural overdetermination, right? A, a belief in uh, an overbelief uh, in the power of structures to, to uh, in general, the idea of a structure is that a structure creates conditions that are independent of people's wills and that are, uh, let's say, objective in their effects on people and countries according to the location in the system. So that's a structural analysis, right? Uh, we're reference to forces to which people have to res uh, resist, to uh, act against, but many of these conditions are beyond people's control. I so, say, you know, like uh, Cuba, pursues a certain model of development. It doesn't pursue the model as it would wish because it, it experiences conditions over which it has no control. And it has to adapt to that and has to do what it can within those limits. And that's the basic problem of development. People can act, but act under conditions not of their choosing and conditions that limit the form that the actions take. So structures uh, don't totally determine, but they do shape. Uh, often actions. And in any case, it's only the first step in analysis. I would always begin, and I, I, I agree, I downplay the subjective political side of the struggles, uh, etc. But uh, in my analysis, that was implicit or implied in resistance because people don't re resist blindly in response to forces that they don't understand, but they are conscious of those forces, and they may misunderstand them, but they act consciously, and they act based on certain beliefs. And that's, that's why in any movement is based on an ideology that people sub subscribe to. So the subjective and the political, yes, very important dimensions of analysis. Uh, I'm not quite sure what point I was making there, but Two minutes? Okay. Uh, I also agree yeah, that I totally left out forms of struggle and resistance in the 1980s, which is the first decade of neoliberalism. I jumped to the peasant movements in the 90s because in, in the 80s there was sort of, um, uh, not only did you have anti-IMF riots, protests, etc., but you have, as you were saying, at the at community level, there was a very conscious attempt to basically uh, uh, to step in where the state stepped out, where the state refused, the community stepped in, and like sort of created soup kitchens, etc., like in Chile and Lima, etc., uh, to help people deal with their problems in Mexico after the big earthquake in 1995. The state was totally absent in its response to the massive earthquake, thousands of, five thousand people uh, killed. It was the people organizing at the, at the community level that responded. So here you have the formation of what some theorists in Europe uh, call sort of uh, new social movements, which basically not class-based, but were based concerned with certain issues, you know, uh, protecting the environment and, you know, uh, well, one movement after another. Uh, I've written a paper on that because I totally disagree with the theory of new social movements. What happened was that these movements were transformed in the 1990s. The discourse, so new social movement disappeared and was replaced by a discourse in civil society, which refers to non-governmental organizations in, uh, in the development. And the 1980s was a mushrooming <coughs> of uh, thousands and thousands of non-governmental organizations, so uh, what we call civil society in, uh, in general, emerged. So, and in fact, in the uh, development discourse, the social, this theory of new social movement disappeared, and in the 1990s, they, they, they picked up on this uh, discourse on civil society. But that relates to another debate on the role of NGOs in development, and, uh, and I have a position on this, which is very often criticized uh, by people who are wrong on that issue. <laughs> uh, okay. okay, one last little point, okay? Uh, so, anti-neoliberalism, post-neoliberalism, uh, I agree, and, and, uh, and I didn't, do not generally argue 
that the uh, so movements of resistance in Latin America are in general post-capitalist, uh, but post-neoliberal. Certainly in terms of the regimes that came to power, their objective was not by any means to move beyond capitalism, but to move beyond neoliberalism. So this is why I refer to this post-neoliberal. Uh, Neo-developmentalism is a, is a, a post-neoliberal strategy. On the other hand, there were some conceptions, some pressures, some movements to push beyond not only neoliberalism, but capitalism. Uh, and here's where post-development comes in. So, like, for example, the, uh, the indigenous conception of bien vivir, to live well in harmony with nature and social solidarity, which is the indigenous communities, intellectuals in, in Ecuador and Bolivia have propagated this idea, and the governments in Bolivia and Ecuador even try to institutionalize it in the constitution, you know, give, protecting the rights of nature as well as humans, etc., etc. The, whole, the idea of bien vivir, you know, like living well in, in harmony with nature and social solidarity, obviously it's not only post neoliberal but it's post capitalist, it's post development. Because you cannot live in harmony with nature and in social solidarity within capitalism. Okay? So, uh, in fact, of course, uh, maybe they have not been able to sort of, how do we say, uh, put it into practice. Uh, but there were certainly, uh, especially in uh, Ecuador and Bolivia, but also Venezuela, uh, there was an orientation to move not only beyond neoliberalism, but beyond capitalism, towards what they called socialism, what Chavez called the socialism of the 21st century. And of course, uh, uh, and Morales calls socialism, who knows, basically communalism. Uh, anyway, so whatever socialism is, it's very different from socialism in the 20th century, like in Cuba, which is sort of like the old socialism. Uh, but it's, it's certainly a form of post-development. Anyway, uh, I, I better stop. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, let's take some questions from the floor. And in the interests of being as inclusive as possible, I'd ask you to keep your questions relatively brief. Uh, we'll take uh, three, three or so at a time. So if you want to put your hand up, we've got some mics coming round. If you want to do the girl in the pink for me first. Hi. Hi. Um, so I was curious just your thoughts, how you position sort of Honduras and sort of the Northern Triangle area where you have a lot of rural peasants leaving, um, you know, because of the violence there. So there's no state action. So if you could just sort of comment on... Okay, great. I think there was one behind you. Hello. Um, I just wanted to know if you could uh, develop a bit on why, the, with the arise of the left-wing governments in the late 90s, the grassroots movement disappeared. I didn't really understand what was the, the link between them. Okay. Yeah, that was exactly. Great. And then the one here? Yes, I'd like to ask a more open version of the previous question about how you evaluate the, let's say, the contending forms of development agendas during the period of the Maria Rosa, the, the Red Tide. And just to explain the question, I mean, as you say, in that period in particular, those governments had support from movements which saw themselves as either anti-capitalists or at least anti-neoliberal. And I think they went beyond civil society in the sense they were trying to create collectively organized forms of livelihood to create an economic base for themselves, somehow independent of neoliberalism, whether that's through workers' cooperatives, land occupations, and so on. And they did obtain some support measures from the state in order to create that alternative, at the same time as, as the income, the exp expenditure depended on the state continuing an extractivist model which just was dispossessing some of the same people. So I want to ask you, you know, how, how do you see conflicts between different forms of development and how you, you know, understand the demise of that whole phenomenon around the, uh, 
what, what's called the Maria Rosa. Okay, great. Do you want to respond and then we'll take a few more? Uh, sure. Um, I think the last two were towards Leander, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, well, uh, uh, yeah, the first, Honduras is a very tragic uh, case of uh, what, what I mentioned is narco capitalism, mm -hmm. which has generated, generated so much not only violence, uh, and for one reason or another, very little <coughs> resistance to that violence. Because in Mexico, at least, you have resistance on part of the government. But in, uh, in um, the right, I mean, very the neoliberal right came back to power some years ago through a coup engineered with the help of the United States. And it was actually the, uh, uh, the institution of this right-wing regime, which has basically made it uh, very, very difficult to deal with the uh, violence, the conditions of which, uh, and of course we're also talking of, con of the violence of, uh, of capital in various forms, uh, moving into the countryside, creating conditions uh, uh, that lead to out migration. And uh, as I said, until a few years ago, these, uh, the, from Guatemala, Honduras, uh, Nicaragua, etc., these are the poorest regions in the whole continent, uh, as I said, they were in Salvador, they were encouraged to take the development pathway out of rural poverty, to migrate, you know, to uh, participate in the labor market and to uh, uh, migrate. It is only now under this uh, lunatic, Trump, that uh, the conditions that have led to this flow of migrants out, the causes of it, and the U.S. has a lot to do with it. It's a big part, there's a big, lot of blame on the U.S. But of course, there's no understanding of the causes, the conditions that led to it, the forces that force people to uh, abandon their, not only their community, but their countries. Well, it's, as I said, it's a very sad thing because these people, they have no choice but to leave the country, to migrate, to, to escape the conditions of that violence. Uh, in terms of... Uh, uh, one issue about the uh, red tide, people refer to the red tide versus the pink tide, right? The red tide referring more to uh, Ecuador, Bolivia, and uh, uh, so on, where the assumption is that uh, it was pushing for more, more radical change, whereas the, the pink tide was basically, reform, was basically a form of pragmatic neoliberalism, post neoliberalism, but very pragmatic with very limited change, uh, based on a model we call it new developmentalism with two pillars. One was uh, inclusionary state activism, right? In other words, that replaced the neoliberal agenda. Uh, now, uh, to reject the neoliberal approach based on the reliance of the free market and to bring the state back in, in what's called inclusionary state activism, combined with extractivism. That was an economic model pursued by all of these countries in South America. We're talking only South America here. You know, uh, well, you meant, someone mentioned social movements at the base of it. What happened was social movements created the conditions that brought the central left to power, but once they came to power, in every case except Bolivia, the social movements were shoved aside. So they were not based on social movements, nor was the development in uh, Venezuela based on the social movements, not at all. Uh, in Bolivia, yes, there was... There, there, of course, there's a lot of manipulation by the government of the social movement, but never, it has a social movement base to the policy, to the strategy pursued. But in, in the, in the so-called uh, pink tide uh, regimes, Argentina, Brazil, etc., uh, there's no social movements behind, uh, not even like the uh, Workers' Party in Brazil. They, they, they did not have the, uh, the most powerful movement in the country, the MST, behind them. You know, in fact, there's a lot of contradictions between uh, the movement and uh, the, the parties. So, uh, uh, I'd just like to make a point that is not based on a question, but uh, that I totally forgot to mention, that the resistance in the current form I mentioned is taking the form of construction of alternative models, right? Which you can look at as post-development or post-neoliberal, mostly post-neoliberal. Uh, but 
One of the most important models that has been constructed all over Latin America is called, uh, can be seen in various experiments in the construction of a social and solidarity economy based on cooperativism, worker self-management like in Brazil and Argentina, and local development. So, so the aim is, like with the Zapatistas, right, is not to uh, confront capital, because what they basically argue is if you fight the beast, you know, the, it's like a hydra. In fact, this is the book that they just recently published, uh, How to Confront the Capitalist Hydra. So if you fight capitalism, you only strengthen it. You know, if you cut off one head, it'll just grow another head. Right, so the, uh, to resist capitalism, don't fight it. Withdraw from it. It's a bit like Samir I mean at the international level in terms of his theory of uh, withdrawal. So and uh, you withdraw from the system by basically uh, not relying on either uh, capital or the state or uh, the market. You might have to engage with it, etc. But based on the construction from within and from below of a, what, they, what they call uh, a social solidarity uh, economy. And it is, this movement is very powerful. You don't hear much of it, but it's all across Latin America. And, and you know, again, while you construct, you construct this economy either in the interstices of the system or on the margins, you know. So sort of like in Argentina, the, where the workers have taken over the, the factories and are running the factories by themselves, etc. They still have to deal with a broader capitalist system but they're trying to create little sort of islands of not socialism, but islands of uh, solidarity economy within the broader capitalist system. So uh, I, all of, what I'm saying is this is a very important form of contemporary resistance that goes beyond the extractive frontier, where the main struggle is against, you know, the uh, negative impacts of uh, extractive operations. Leandro, would you like to respond? Yes. Um, um, what I think um, happened to movements in under left-wing governments, uh, in order to explain it, we have to go back to what the movements were in these periods of crisis, first crisis of legitimacy of neoliberalism in, in the late 1990s. Um, I agree with Henry that the, the, the parties that, that we see taking power in the mid-2000s are no longer parties that represent movements, but they did get to power on the back of social movement mobilization, even in Argentina. If you think of Argentina, the, the, the currency crisis at the beginning of 2000 created massive movements within the middle class, the working class, peasant movements, uh, in order to try to create a space for e generate income, uh, gain, having control, uh, gain, gaining back control of the means of production, the, the factory, uh, uh, the occupation factories, uh, all these kinds of, of, of movements also talked about autonomy, trying to organize, self-organize away from the state. But they never really completely were autonomous from the state. A lot of uh, their demands were very often demands towards the state, but what they didn't want was to completely subordinate their objective, their struggles, to the state or to political parties. The other, the other important characteristic of all these movements, put piqueteros, landless movement, Zapatista, indigenous, indigenous movement against the, the water privatization, Bolivia, etc. All of them were internally organized in, in assembly, in, in participatory decision kind of mechanism, consensus building. All these movements, had the, uh, uh, the strength of these movement was based on the fact that they politicized their membership. So they were not only movement that were able to mobilize people in a march, but they were all also able to create political activists in, in constant uh, renewable, renewal depending on the years of, of struggle. So that was what the strength of movement, but toward the mid-2000s, many of these movements had already exhausted their, their capacity. A lot of them had started establishing alliances with political parties because it's, they, they, they still saw 
the state or taking control of the state in one way or another as, a, as an option, as a possibility, as a need, even the MST, I don't alliance with the PT. It, every, every election, and the PT right now is trying, to, uh, the, the MST is trying to defend the PT. Yeah. So the, the, it, all the movements were sort of septic against move, uh, political parties, but they still had connections and participated with political parties. But political parties during that era become very much electoral machines. And they're, they're not the type of, they don't do the same kind of internal uh, uh, action or, or, or they don't lead to the same kind of process that a social movement does. And what happens in these governments is that social movements sort of leave the, 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 the space to the state. They basically retreat and they actually lose their capacity to mobilize during these movements, during these, 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 these uh, governments. And we're now in the situation in Latin America where movements do not don't long, longer have the ability to resist the right wing wave. So we're going to have very difficult years, I think, in Latin America in the coming years. Because all what had existed in terms of magma, if you want, social magma, in the movements has gone and it has to be recreated. Uh, I, th I think we, we look at it in the same way, because uh, as I said, my p whole point was that the social movements created the conditions <coughs> for the emergence of these uh, progressive regimes, uh, but once they came to power, well, you can either say they lost steam in the movement, or they're pushed aside. Or many, many of their leaders are, are actually government position, certain, if you look at the, uh, yeah, the agricultural but, but side. But in any case, a lot of the states operated to demobilize the same, uh, the same movement. Yeah. So that it is not correct. Look at these movements, the, the left regimes, a social movement based. Yeah. Uh, that's my point, except in the case of Bolivia. Okay, great. Well, we'll take a final round of questions, but luckily we are having a reception after this where we can continue the conversation. So we're going to go to the senior common room for some drinks and some nibbles. So if you don't get the chance to ask a question now, bring it, have a drink and ask it there. Uh, there was somebody over there who had their hand up very strongly. Then I'm going to go to the girl in the red at the back and then I'll go to you. So I have two brief questions. You might have touched upon them a little bit, but I want you to expand. Um, the first one is, um, what is your assessment on Venezuela and the Maduro regime right now? Do you see it uh, as a case of the resurgence of right-wing neoliberal forces, or still you see it as a case of post-neoliberalism? Because surely it's not a post-extractivist, as they are still relying on the infiltration of extractive capital. The second question is about the resistance and the social movements. Um, I'm not sure you are aware of this um, dynamic and initiative led by the MST and some other ALBA movements to construct an alternative to the World Social Forum. I have been involved in it for the last two years, and we're going to organize a P an international people's assembly in Venezuela in February 2019. I'm conflicted about it, um, as I see they see it as um, a way to build a radical alternative, a truly anti-imperialist and anti-capitalist world social forum. But at the same time, it seems to me that it is non-autonomous and it is subordinated to the states and the elite they are defending, like PT, Lula, and the Maduro regime. So I wanted to get your opinion on that. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, yep. Hi. Um, I was just wondering, as Mexico is an exception to the current trend um, in terms of the political pendulum with the recent election of López Obrador, AMLO, um, I was just wondering why, what it is that you think is particular to Mexico and its history of neoliberalism and the particular stage that it is at that has allowed it to be so. And that's all. Thank you. Um, I would like to ask you if you can, um, if you can tell us, um, do you have any um, definition when it comes to post-developmental alternatives to development? Um, what would be the sort of political or ethical framework for them? Because um, 
I understand post development is very much um, open, radically open, because it wants to avoid those sort of um, falling into the trap of uh, coming up with uh, predetermined blueprint solutions of uh, like development does. Um, but can we come up with some sort of ethical, political framework? And uh, relatedly, would you say that, uh, for instance, what I'm looking at is um, how to bring anarchist philosophy and post-development um, closer together, because I feel that would offer uh, one such framework. OK, great. Do you want to offer some answers to those? OK. Thank you. Well, in the case of Venezuela, another sad situation. Hmm. Uh, Venezuela is in the crosshairs of U.S. imperialism, and the U.S. is doing everything that it can to destabilize, undermine, and get rid of the regime, to the point that they have financed to an incredible amount the, uh, a lot of the so-called actors, uh, economic groups in the country, for, for them to basically take off the market food and basic foods. Uh, and warehouse them, take them off the market to, to generate uh, not only, quote, food shortages, uh, but to provoke uh, uh, the uh, protest of the urban poor, which was the, the base of the, the whole movement. So there's a lot of things like that going on, and there's a lot of machinations. And uh, so it's, it's very difficult for a regime that is uh, is based is uh, development on extractive, uh, and it's one of the most extractivist regimes in all of Latin America. Ninety-five percent of public funds come from uh, the export of oil, the prices of which has plummeted over the last four or five years. So you have that problem. You have the problem of U.S. imperialism, and you have the problems of a uh, uh, lot of mistakes. You know, on on how to deal with all of these pressures and all these forces. So, you know, they've made uh, uh, um, a, a, a lot of mistakes. So it's been difficult to implement what they call a socialist agenda from above, which is basically to socialize and nationalize the means of production. But on the other hand, there's some very interesting, uh, another side to what's been happening in Venezuela, what people don't often hear about, which is um, the conscious effort of the government to promote uh, let's say socialism from below by creating a set of uh, community-based institutions like communal councils, etc., and uh, cooperative forms of organizing uh, production, both in agriculture and in other sectors. So, for example, when Chavez took power, there uh, there were 80 uh, <coughs> cooperatives uh, in the country, and now there's over 20,000 uh, cooperatives. So that's a lot. And so people, you have to realize there's a lot of energy and a lot of uh, spent by people in the grassroots, in the communities, in bringing about development under their own control, in an attempt to basically construct, uh, as I say, uh, a social solidarity economy from below. So in theory, uh, the socialism that takes form that is the project is to create socialism from above and from below. But it's mainly is to bring it from below with state support from above to create an institutional framework that allows socialism to emerge from below. But you can imagine the difficulty of creating socialism in any form uh, under these absolutely horrible uh, crisis, conditions of economic uh, crisis. Uh, which, you know, uh, basically, for which uh, the U.S. government, or what we call U.S. imperialism, is not fully to blame, but it, it is uh, to blame to an incredible extent. Apart from that, the government made all kinds of mistakes, as many all governments do, like all of us do, right? Because, uh, you know, if you're dealing with these kind of problems, you're likely to make mistakes, because you have very few options. You have a lot of what we call structural forces operating on you beyond your control. You can't do anything about them. Even the conditions that is leading to this uh, super, super inflation, it's very difficult for the government to do anything about that uh, as long as it's tied into a global economy based on the dollar. 
uh, and the ability to sell uh, oil for dollars. So a solution would be to have its own currency. There's various solutions, but these solutions, uh, the Venezuelan government can't, are beyond the control of the Venezuelan government. It would have to rely on uh, support from Bolivia and other governments. That is it's no longer there. My thing keeps coming out. There was another question. What happened here? It says no. One. Mexico. <laughs> Mexico. Um, well, we, well, we've been talking about the, uh, the pink and red wave uh, and extractive capitalism and, po and the neo-developmentalism all has to do with South America, you know. Uh, Argentina, Brazil, Chile, uh, Uruguay, uh, uh, Ecuador, uh, Venezuela, etc. Right. So, uh, two countries in particular continue to uh, push the neoliberal line, uh, aligned with the United States, Colombia, and the United States. So they've been they've been pursuing a, a neoliberal program all along. So when we're talking of now the uh, the emergence of this um, uh, the left uh, in the form of AMLO, um, you have to remember. Well, for one thing, this is I think his third attempt to come to power, and he came to power once, but he was it was taken from him through uh, uh, voting fraud, etc. Et but there's been there there's always been. Uh, let's say, this political force uh, against the neoliberal agenda of governments which has been pursued f since 1982, since Salinas, uh, way, way, way back, way back. So, uh, uh, so the, the dynamics that we talked about in the, the whole talk has really little to do with Mexico except for the uh, first, the, well, the, the second phase in the early 90s, the neoliberal agenda, which was led by, um, by uh, Mexico. But I think precisely because it has pursued that agenda all along, that uh, uh, eventually, you know, the political force of opposition to that agenda, and is only mildly opposed to it, he's not a socialist or anything, uh, you know, this is, uh, people don't even know what his uh, what his agenda is, but I should also you should also keep in mind that in the last year or so and the next year, 18 month period, uh, I think the 17 governments are changing governments. There's elections, presidential elections going on in 17 different countries, and in many cases you have a shift to the right. Uh, but even like in Colombia, where you have the shift to the right or a right winger on the, came to power, this, the second political force was a set, uh, based on a center-left coalition. And it almost came to power. It wasn't far behind. The same thing in Peru and in Chile. In other words, uh, there are actually uh, uh, political forces on, in electoral politics. Uh, it's not all just a uh, you know, uh, move to the right, sort of. Uh, uh, even in, uh, in Argentina and uh, Brazil, hopefully, uh, well, in, well, of course you have the, the PT in uh, Brazil. You, you, you have other forces, force, progressive forces, that are continuing to operate. And uh, under, under what conditions they might even come back to power? As I said before, at the very beginning, it depends on the correlation of force in the class struggle. And it's, that's difficult to determine. Andrew, do you want okay. a very brief <clears throat> just, wrapping just on up? the question on uh, on the social forum and the need for a new sort of international for social movements, uh, the problem that when we use the term autonomy, we tend to associate that term with a radical idea of it that is very much influenced by the anarchist tradition, right? Where you actually block or, or avoid or reject any relationship with, with the state or even with the market, right? So uh, 
But in, the, in reality, the practice of autonomy, and especially in the case of the MST, is, is negotiated. It's pragmatic. The MST has had a very pragmatic relationship with state and with political parties. If you think about it's a struggle for land, right? So it asks the state to redistribute land. So their basis for mobilization is directly asking the state for something, okay? But that doesn't mean that they have accepted everything from the state. Even once they receive land, they negotiate what a state intervention is going to look like on their territory, on the settlements. So they will accept a cre credit scheme, they will reject it, they will oppose it, or they will negotiate and on education, for example. They negotiate the type of education they want on their settlement, and it's basically the method that they've used, liberation the uh, 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 pedagogy, pedagogy of, uh, of the oppressed that they use, and they force the state to fund their school, which is run with a completely different methodology. Right, so, um, they, they, it's only a few movements, for example, like the Zapatista, that really radically break with the state and the market. The rest of us actually negotiate our way with the state. So if that organization that is being put forward is receiving funds from Venezuela or from the PT, well, you need funds from somewhere, MST uh, activists will say. The thing is that you don't need to, support, to subordinate yourself to the commands of these organizations. And, and the world is in need for something different than the World Social Forum, I, I would say. And even the World Social Forum has been in a process of critique, in certain internal critique, and rethinking it itself for the at least past five years. And something has to come out that is stronger, that can take position on, on the struggle that we have in front of us, than a place where simply people meet and exchange ideas, you know? Okay, fantastic. Well, thank you all so much for coming tonight. Thank you to our speaker. Thank you so much, Henry. Thank you.